Hey, happy Tuesday. This is Medusa was framed and my name is Joyce. First thing I wanna say is thank you to Kelly for taking me to lunch today. What a delight to meet you and catch up on so many things. So this past weekend, I spent with a friend in Crescent City, Florida, which is south and west of me here in St. Augustine. It is, formerly it was a big citrus place um, before the freeze and uh, has a very large lake, Crescent Lake, which is known as the bass capital of the world. So it's long been a tourist place for non-beach water activities. Um, anyway, I hadn't spent too much time there. There's uh, a great deal of very impressive history in the hinderlands of Florida. In the center of Florida, there's a great deal of history, a great deal of um, Moorish architecture that continues to stand. Um, and uh, we won't even get into the fact that the native uh, folks here, the Timaquin, were giants. <sighs> yes. Anyway, I had the opportunity to visit four cemeteries in a very old area. Um, and of course, I took a lot of pictures. The last video I did, I had to end it abruptly because in my, uh, shall we say, um, <laughs> excitement, I pushed the wrong button and uh, kind of ended the share abruptly. And so I just ended it there because I had a lot of photos and today I have over 200 photos of grave sites. So uh, yeah, so there were some things that I was starting to cover in the other one and my um, fat fingers ended. So I'm going to start with those. I'm going to start with some shares about some Google Earth snaps of Crescent City and explaining a little bit about a bird's eye view of all the um, the gridded buildings that still stand, the uh, Antiquatech or remnants of Antiquatech that still stand, and the fact that Crescent City is between the enormous Crescent Lake that's 13 miles long and two miles wide with no more than five or six feet depth on the east and Lake Stella on the west. So it's sort of a peninsula. Clearly a very important plasma and ether collecting site for our ancestors that did not live in grass huts. So. So this is to give you an idea of where I was. I live up here just south of Jacksonville in St. Augustine. Tallahassee's our capital. Hi, Ron. That's Georgia. That's Alabama. Crescent City's right here. It's about an hour from me. You drive an hour and you go into another time. Now, along with uh, the buildings and the quote unquote churches, there are two gazebos that still stand. This is one. This one is on Lake Stella, so the smaller lake. And you can see it's on an octagon that very likely could have been raised and uh, needless to say, there was a time when there was a spire there. So just remember that. This is one of the churches, cough, cough, that is in 
Crescent Beach. And I have this goofy photo from Google Earth because I actually didn't find out about this until I left and I was doing a little research for this presentation today. This is known as the Mount Zion Overcoming the Body of Christ, the True Bride Church. Yeah, all of that. And it's, there's the address, it's at 749 Junction Road in Crescent City. And there on the bottom, you can see the coordinates. There is very little about this place, but uh, I'll show you in an overhead map, its significance as part of the grid. We are supposed to believe that a woman who had been ministering to people in New York, uh, a woman by the name of Elsie Mae McDonald, um, came back here. Well, she was born here. She was born in Crescent City. Her mother still owned the property. She moved to New York and did some preaching up there. And then she came back here. And we are to believe that in 1960, she decided that she was going to build a church that was also going to be uh, kind of a, a community center arc type of thing. One of the things I was reading referred to it as an arc. Has a hundred rooms inside. There are no pictures of the inside. And um, four kitchens, 100 rooms, worship rooms, and uh, a soap production room. So that must have been part of how Miss McDonald made her work. Uh, the tower is 400 feet tall, and the building is 10,711 square feet. Um, Miss Elsie May died in 2005 at 95, and she's laid to rest in Evergreen Cemetery, which is the cemetery that I spoke of yesterday. We are to believe that she was the architect and designer of this and handled its building after inheriting the property from her mother. No, this wasn't here. No, this wasn't here. She built it all. So just take a look. Isn't that interesting? Huh. Steps up to the doors because the doors were too tall. Yeah, you know the drill. This is another shot. Yep. Bell Tower. Of course, the plasma collectors were covered with crosses. She built the cross. Yep. We're supposed to believe that she built all that because she inherited the property from her mother after her mother died. Uh-huh. Sure. The Mount Zion, overcoming the body of Christ, true bride church. She believed that she was the true bride of Christ. Now, this is another church. Cough, cough, in the very small town of Crescent City an old citrus town. Let's just take a look. Old bell tower, spire's gone. Hmm, wonder what that's about. Hmm. This is the Jethro First Baptist at 101 Cedar. This I went into yesterday. This is the Church of Holy Comfort. Um, and this is another one of those <laughs> incidents where some chosen 
fellow who wasn't even a formally trained architect all of a sudden was credited with designing and executing very complicated buildings all over a city after a fire or the likes. The building of this was attributed to Richard Upjohn in 1878. It's located at 223 North Summit. Summit is the main street. Uh, it's also State Road 17. He's uh, British. He was a carpenter, a cabinet maker. And uh, he is supposed to have learned how to design churches from being a cabinet maker. He fled England because he had so much debt, came to America, started building, was in New York and Massachusetts, was building, 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 and apparently he got really good at what he did. And the bishop in St. Augustine heard about him and needed someone to build a church down here in Crescent City and in other places in Central Florida because the, sum, the winter tourist season was expanding such. People were asking for churches while they were being snowbirds. And so he hired up John to come down. That's the story. He became known for these churches that were not made of stone, that were built in communities along big rivers and lakes in central Florida. And this was referred to as Carpenter Gothic. And his movement was known as the River Church Movement. And many churches, not only here in the St. Augustine and South area, but all throughout Florida are attributed to him. Um, he's also the guy that's supposed to have built Trinity Cathedral in New York City in 1846. I have photos in the other video, the one before it, the one I did before this. Um, I don't have any of those because it's all review, but uh, yeah. So a cabinet maker with no formal architectural education or training is supposed to have designed this and many other churches and then managed to go on to masonry churches. Uh-huh, sure. He, created uh, I didn't write it down but he's noted as the founder of the American Association of Architects or something like that architect architects of America something like that and while retired essentially from this work uh, and running that organization he is said to have designed a river church once a year for the rest of his life and became known as someone who would design an inauspicious, affordable church for congregations that were on the smaller side, um, that were affordable, that were made out of masonry. Okay, whatever. Look up Richard Upjohn and the thing that Richard Upjohns are supposed to have created, including Trinity Cathedral, and uh, have a good laugh about that. But let's move on. So this is Mother Elsie Mae McDonald. This is the woman who passed away in 2005, who we're supposed to believe designed and had that church built no education in masonry or carpentry or architecture, none at all. <sighs> yeah, that's her, bless her heart. So this is another church that is in a small region there of uh, 
Crescent City. This is very near my friend's house. This is at the corner of, um, gosh, what is it? Uh, Lemon and Maine. And this is St. John the Baptist Chapel. Now there's also a St. John the Baptist Catholic Church. So they seem to be owned by the same people. It's not just because they have the same name. Um, that Catholic Church appears to own this church. And the first cemetery that you're gonna see pictures about, Eden Cemetery, are affiliated with these two churches. This is a beautiful, beautiful church in the middle of houses. Got your resonators here. Got rid of the bell tower. There's the back. So it's built up quite a bit. Another shot of the front. Would you look at that? Huh. Now that's something we noticed with one of the churches I showed yesterday. Why would you build a basement on a floodplain? Lake Stella is four or five blocks away from this. And the enormous Lake Crescent is about six blocks away. This is a floodplain. This wasn't even on the highest point on Summit Ridge. Why would you build a basement on a floodplain? And look how it's uneven. Huh. So this is on the same street as that little church. The little church, St. John the Baptist Chapel, is right behind this church. This is the First Baptist at 101 South Summit. And again, I had a lot of pictures about that yesterday. It's also uneven. It has basement windows, mud flood windows, whatever you want to call them. <sighs> what is that? Hmm. I guess they built it up and turned this into some kind of storage. Or was the door so big that they built a platform to make it smaller? <laughs> Resonator. Toroid coils, right? Arches. Uh -huh. Yesterday I took pictures on the sides, um, or I shared pictures that I took on the sides where you can see it's uneven like the last one is. And this is How Memorial Methodist. This is an old postcard. Oh no, excuse me, this is First Baptist. I'm sorry, this is an old postcard. Um, but it still looks like this for the most part. The windows are different, but um, here the windows are different. But again, huh, wonder how big that door is because there's a level here. And why would you build windows right onto the ground on a floodplain? Again, this church is four or five blocks away from Lake Stella on one side and five or six blocks away from Crescent Lake on the other. Huh, what? what? You can go in there, but you have to go up here and you have to step down here. Isn't that strange? What does that remind you of? Hmm. So this is the other extant gazebo. This is the one in Lake Stella Park. You will see the significance of Lake Stella Park in the overheads. Um, 
you can see it's also an octagon. Beautiful. This is where the uh, state famous catfish festival is held, taken over by the catfish. Okay, so now we've got some snaps from Google Earth. And so this is Lake Stella here, the smaller lake, the west side lake. And this is where that gazebo is on Lake Stella. This is a, they've uh, redone it fairly recently and you see they've reinforced the edge of the lake a bit and they've put in a bike path and parking and it's really beautiful back here. This area of town is just gorgeous. But yeah, so that gazebo is right on the lake. Huh, isn't that interesting? This is the old Main Street. That's not called Main Street, um, but it's the main, it used to be the main shopping street. And there are a lot of historical buildings that are still on there. I have a picture of a couple of them. You can see this old rusty roof. That's one of them. And I think it might be, it might be this building that I caught a picture from my car of. But yeah, there are some wonderful old, uh, Tartarian building still standing there. This was a, this was a very powerful uh, energy generating area. So here's Lake Stella, and this is Crescent Lake, and uh, there's the main part of Crescent City. And I'm going to give you more details into all of this once I start the slideshow of the cemetery. Um, so this is Summit Road. This is the main street. And so we've got um, the one, that might be it right there actually, the one uh, gazebo over there. And then the other gazebo is, let's see if I can, might be right in here. This might be Ava Lion Park where the other um, gazebo is. But you see, it's, it's all water. Okay, so now we have an idea. So Ava Lion Park, that's where the gazebo is, right here. That's where one of the gazebos is. And you see, oh, there's a star formation there. It's known for the shuffleboard uh, decks. Um, there are very old postcards that I found. It, that being one of the touristy things. People would go there to play shuffleboard. So now here's all the churches. Here's First Baptist. Look at that angle. Here's the Howe Memorial Methodist Church. That was the one with the strange front door and then the steps up either side of it and all of that. And then right behind here, this is that tiny St. Uh, John the Baptist church. One, two, three. I'm not sure if the other church is in this picture. The other church, the other, the Jericho church, uh, might be, it's in another shot, I think. Oh no, actually, that might be it there. It's very close to the water. Interesting, right? This is not New York City <laughs> or Jacksonville. There were only a few hundred people living here in the 1880s. All these churches. So here's just another shot. That's Lake Stella back there. There's the gazebo at Ava Lion Park. That's the First Baptist right across the way. The uh, Church of the Comforter is in there too. Uh, I just didn't note it last time. So I'm gonna get my bearings here real quick. Okay. So here's Lake Stella, here's Crescent Lake over here. This is the main part of downtown. Now, 
This is the gazebo at on Lake Stella, okay? And let me find. Okay, and this is the main street that was the shopping street. It still has several Tartarian buildings. This is Summit Street right here, the main thoroughfare, US 17. There are two Tartarian buildings that are right here that I have pictures of later. And then further down on this side, there are a couple more. All these churches for a very small town. I mean, even now there's only supposed to be 1600 people in this community. All these churches, and this is, this by no means is all the churches. There's lots of churches there, but they're not in old Tartarian buildings. <laughs> oh my goodness. There's a church. That's a church. That's the church with the funny door, and that's the St. John the Baptist back there. And then that Methodist church. Methodist church, I think. that one or that one I can't remember which but you see they're all in a real small space hmm hmm look at it's not a big area again Crescent Lake This is the big Catholic church, the main Catholic church, which is not Tartarian. It's, it's ugly, modern church looking. But you sure get a sense of the size of Crescent Lake and Lake Stella, right? So the big Catholic church, which was not a power generator, is down here a little bit south. Everything else, you can see the grid right there. But look at the size of Crescent Lake, right? A lot of etheric power there. And that's another shot of that gazebo on Lake Stella. Okay, this is an apartment building now, but this is one of the old standing power generator buildings that's still on the main drag there. And uh, I took this, so that's exactly what it looks like. I took that from my car really quickly, but you see, of course, you see the coiling arches and the keystones, and you see there are things on the roof. Of course, we don't know what it looked like before, but the concrete and brick with all this antiquitech, the doors, see the, the doors originally were taller. And that's on uh, the main drag. So this is Summit Street right here, the main drag. And then if you were to turn down this street, you would go to Crescent Lake on the old shopping street. If you were to come back the other way, you'd be at Lake Stella. Look at this, isn't that beautiful? Look at that. And isn't it nice that the city, the city preserves those? Look at that resonator right there. Holy cow, look at that, you know? I wonder if originally, um, you know, this had the layers of, uh, you know, the six solfagio layers, like you see in a lot of quote unquote ancient churches, right? I mean, certainly that's what the shape was. I wonder if they just jacked that up. You see? Power collectors. 
And look at that. Look at that masonry, that old concrete that we don't know how to create anymore. That beautiful molded masonry. Just glad it's still there. Okay, so I'm just gonna leave all that for you to ponder. I just, that was something that I wanted to close the other video with. I'm finishing this one with it just to kind of, well, finish that one out, but also add to the, uh, the fertilizer for your brain that uh, this was indeed an energetic city. Doesn't seem to have had a star, but uh, certainly it had powerful ether collectors. Now, one of the cemeteries that I wanted to go to was the oldest one, which is known as the uh, Braddock, or also known as Mason Davis Cemetery. So this is a historical marker that's on the property. I'll zoom that up so you can take a look. But I'm also going to read you something. I didn't even read. That. Anyway, I'm going to read you what I have. So it's at 233 Denver Road. It's actually on private property now. Um, you can walk onto some of it. You can walk where this sign is, but you can't walk too far back into where the stones are. And as far as I know, there are only two stones left. My understanding is. Um, that the stones that were there have been collected and are in uh, some kind of protected environment as they had deteriorated so much and the forest has just taken the site over. So, and I'm finding this more and more um, with these old battle sites. They just leave the coffins or however the people were buried there with no acknowledgement of their being laid to rest there and they take the stones somewhere to preserve them. But how are you supposed to know where the people are? Anyway, so the Battle of Braddock's Farm. Well, clearly this was property that belonged to a gentleman named Braddock. So we've talked about St. Augustine and Jacksonville in the 1860s, right? Jacksonville was the capital and biggest city at the time. Back then in those Spanish, French, Spanish, English days. Um, so in the 1860s to come out of the city area, to come out of Jacksonville was uh, damn dangerous, right? Um, there were developments, there was farming going on. Uh, personal farms and plantation farming and the likes, but you had, you couldn't just be one family out there. It wasn't very safe. Uh, we had really succeeded in pissing off the, well, we had already wiped out the Timaquin, which called, they call themselves Tokobago. We call them Timaquin. And we were in the process of rounding up and getting rid of who we call the Seminole, Seminole being a derogatory word based on a Spanish word that means runaway. They called themselves uh, Muskegee. Anyway, so the inlands of Florida were not a very safe place. There were some U.S. force groups that patrolled, but they were few and far between. Florida actually was the least populated state by the Confederacy at that point. Uh, it was small bands of Confederate forces that would defend the state pretty much from the center of the state outward. And a Captain Dickinson was one of those Confederate band leaders. So a Mr. James A. Braddock owned this farm. 
wasn't called Crescent City at the time. He and his sons both served the Confederacy during the Civil War and the land that he lived on, which is still farmland uh, owned by the current property owner, was a very successful farmer and rancher. So Florida had really been torn apart by the Spanish coming in, the British coming in, the Spanish coming back, the Civil War, the war between the indigenous and the Spanish, the war between the indigenous and the Americans, Florida, uh, Florida was pretty tore up. So as I said, the farmers and the ranchers that were brave enough to have property on the inside were pretty much self-sufficient. But they also, because of the fertility of this land, right? Thousands and thousands and thousands of years of floodplain um, had very successful farms. The crops grew very easily. Now, Mr. Braddock was one of the farmers that helped supply the Confederacy with the things they needed. Horses, mules, food, cotton, rice, you name it. And at the time, the Union Army thought, well, all we have to do is cut off the supply from some of these high producing farms and will starve the Confederacy and they'll surrender. So in February of 1865, a Colonel Albert Wilkeson, the commanding officer of the Union forces in St. Augustine, took 75 men into this region of the state. They took over Braddock's farm and they used it as a headquarters to raid other farms. Their purpose was to get everything off the farms, take absolutely everything, all the stock, all the food, all the uh, wool, all the cotton, you name it. Get everything and take it back to St. Augustine. And so those supplies wouldn't go to the Confederate Army. So our Captain Dickinson, who was one of the captains who had this kind of militia type band of Confederate soldiers, got word of Wilcoxon's assault and he and his raiders sent in 50 of them to stop this dude and his nefarious acts. So they were shortly out of Braddock's farm. Apparently he and his infantry, Wilkerson, the union guy, he and his infantry were leaving Braddock farm with 10 wagons of supplies and stock. And Dickinson and his dudes got him. And there was a battle right there. Apparently no Confederates were killed, but the Union lost four men plus Colonel Wilkerson. So now it gets exciting. So Captain Dickinson took Colonel Wilkinson's sword home so that he could return it to his widow. Um, who knows, right? Apparently there was a big deal made out of that because now this is going to come as a surprise to you. Colonel Wilkerson of the Union Army was a Mason. And it was a special Masonic sword. Isn't that surprising to know that there were Masons involved in the Civil War? Huh. Apparently uh, eight of the Union guys escaped and ran into the swamp and then made it back to St. Augustine and the rest of the 70, that's not quite 70 then, were taken as prisoners. So this marker marks where that happened. And it went into a great deal of disrepair where the battle happened, where 
the people that died were buried, but also where Mr. Braddock, the farm owner and some of his family were buried, as was common at the time. You bury your family on your property farm. It was all overgrown and it apparently was a city dump for over 10 years. So there was something called the Braddock Farm Project that started in 1995 and ran to 2000. And it took that long. Uh, people came in and cleaned out the dump. And that's when some of the old markers were found. And some of them through flooding and whatnot had actually been washed completely off of their place and were just laying about or in pieces. And they were taken to, I don't know what museum to be preserved. Um, there were two markers that we don't know if they're standing in the right place or not, but they were repositioned and righted and standing um, straight. And one of them is Braddock, you'll see it, it's an obelisk. And that's all that remains. So I took that picture. That's what it looks like now. This picture you see was when the sign was new. That's what it looks like now. And that's what the sign on the road looks like now. And that's the entrance to it. Well, for those of you that saw my impromptu video of walking through the cemetery on the side of 207, in uh, Hastings, you know that I did not come dressed to go traipsing through knee high stickers and shrubs. I walked in a bit, I walked in, I walked back to here, but I couldn't get any farther. There's some trees that have fallen back here and there's a lot of overgrowth and uh, I, I wasn't, you can see there's a tree that fell right there. I just, I didn't have the shoes. My, I had on a, a sarong, my legs were getting scratched. And so I didn't go back there. But um, anyway, uh, I had not made plans to contact the landowner and ask for permission um, because I didn't at the time know that the cemetery looked like this. So, I was not prepared for all of that, but this is one of the standing stones of uh, the two that are, are still there. And again, we have no idea how many people are buried there. Well, I'm sure the city knows, the county probably knows too, but there are only two stones standing. This is one and that's Mr. Braddock's. So I believe that these photos, which I did not take, were taken back after the cleanup project. Well, that could have been 20 years ago. Um, I've read that these two used to be visible from the road. I'm telling you, 20 years ago, they might've been, but they're not now. Anyway, so that is my story of the first cemetery. interesting story, isn't it? I think so. Okay, now we're going to go to the Eden Cemetery. And this is the cemetery that is affiliated with both John the Baptist Catholic churches, both the church and the chapel. After the Eden Seminary, Cemetery photos, I have another cemetery that I photographed that I did on the way out of town, which is known as Lake Cuomo Pomona Park Cemetery. This one is in town, um, not too far from my friend's house. It's, it's in the center of everything. It's very close to the water. And um, I'm going to put this on slideshow now and let you guys just see all the uh, stones. Um, before I do that, uh, my video um, about, um, gosh, what was it about? Oh, the Tolomato Cemetery, where um, I talked about it was the first place 
in St. Augustine where the Menorcan indentured servants from the Toonville Indigo Plantation in uh, Volusia County came seeking refuge from that plantation. Um, a bunch of uh, Mediterranean indentured servants that came over and that's a whole other story. But this uh, is a very important name in that group, uh, Pelissier. Uh, we have a, a, a creek uh, named Pelissier in Flagler County. And this apparently is a very uh, important resting place for this family anyway. And you'll see those close up. Let me just put that on slideshow and um, let that go. Okay, so that's gonna go. And again, this is Ian Cemetery. When you're done with these, there'll be another marker like that that says, next is the Lake Cuomo Pomona Park Cemetery. So while I'm reading, you may see two, group, two groups and you'll be able to tell because it was, um, this cemetery is still reasonably well cared for. The, the Lake Como Pomona Park one is down a dirt road and it's a mess. Anyway, so let's talk a little bit about the history of Crescent City. So Lake Crescent, which you've seen a couple overhead photos, takes up over 1,600 acres. It's the third largest natural freshwater lake in Florida, 13 miles long, two miles wide, and no more than five or six feet deep. The largest lake in Florida is Lake Okeechobee down just north of Miami. It connects to the massive St. John's River via Dunn's Creek. So Crescent City is in Putnam County and South Putnam County was settled in the 1700s by various English plantation owners making their uh, main crops rice and indigo. Before the city was incorporated, this region was known of as Ellington. It was officially founded in 1852, being a part of the old Oliver Plantation, which included 1,800 acres. After founding, the early economy was based on citrus and tourism. By 1890, there was a population of 555 people. So that was 40 years after founding. Now there isn't a whole lot of information that I could find on those churches, but you figure those churches would have been built in that time frame by looking at them, right? So again, I gotta ask, do we really need two, three, four, five, six, seven churches? And there were more than that. I just talked about seven. Do we really need seven churches for a population of less than a thousand people? Oh, you think they were built as churches? I don't. So the great freeze was 1894 to 1895 and it killed most of the citrus industry. Um, and then the depression killed the tourism and it was so bad that people that had come here and invested in large growth acreages, um, literally got in their wagons and left. They just left everything on the property. Their furniture, their animals, they just packed up and left. There was nothing more. So there is still citrus grown in the area. In fact, um, the oldest organic citrus ranch in Florida is in Crescent City. It's called Eagle's Nest. Organic farm. It's now 
known as the bass capital of the world. That's its claim to fame in tourism. And what came to be a real productive crop is ferns and foliage. And so Crescent City now produces 84, 84 percent of America's cut foliage. Isn't that fascinating? I had no idea. 84 percent. So when you go into a flower shop or shoot, even if you go into your grocery store and they're selling flowers, all that green stuff might have come from here. So a really, really important person in uh, the history of American civil rights was born in Christian City. A. Philip Randolph was the founder of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. He was born in Crescent City in 1889. He became a prominent civil rights leader and Randolph Street in Crescent City is named after him. Um, so this was a black gentleman, I'll read more about him later, who formed the first union of Pullman car workers, and that grew into other things. He also was key in uh, educational desegregation and the likes. There are two historic listings for the U.S. Registry of Historic Places. One is Hubbard House, which is an old plantation style house, beautiful. And the other is the whole Crescent City Historic District um, for which all of the churches I showed you are in it. And I told you the Eagle's Nest is the oldest organic orange grove in Florida. More recently, the House for American College of Applied Sciences, ACIS, ACAS, and its 20 acre dream pond science field station and reserve for animal science and behavior studies is in Crescent City. They have dogs, horses, donkeys, llamas, sheep, goats, chickens, guinea fowl, and aquatic birds for a variety of animal husbandry research and studies. Cool, again, I had no idea. Okay, so back to the accomplishments of Mr. Randall. So the BC, BSCP, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, was founded in 1925. And it was the first labor organization led by Black folks to receive a charter from the AFL, American Federation of Labor. Very cool. They gathered memberships of 18,000 passenger railway workers across Canada, Mexico, and the US. And apparently after the Civil War, a Pullman Porter job was a very important one for the Black community, many of whom were freed slaves, right? In 1960s, rail travel declined as car usage inclined. So the BSCP membership declined too. And in 1976, it merged with the Brotherhood of Airline Clerks, BRAC, and is now known as the Transportation Communications International Union. So Mr. Randolph and his founding vice president, Milton Webster, and a C.L. Dullums, who was the second serving president, became leaders in the civil rights movement and eradication of segregation in education in the American South. Very cool. Six weeks after the formation of the BSCP, the female Pullman employees, which included maids, manicurists, uh, care for any infirm people and um, that general thing, who were known as unskilled service workers, formed the Women's Economic Council officially recognized as the International Ladies Auxiliary to the BSCP in 1938. So this is really cool. So this guy, oh, by the way, this is the other cemetery now. This is the late Cuomo Cemetery. And you can see the difference. See, it's, it's all tore up and it's, it's down a long dirt road. Um, so you've got this guy in the South, right? Um, leading the Black community. And then that organization starts leading the women in the black community. I mean, that's really cool. 
Um, many of the women had worked in New York's booming garment industry and gained experience in union act activism when they did so in the International Ladies Garments Workers Union. And like a lot of people, you know, they came south because it was easier. Um, and the Ladies Garment Workers Union sought to increase membership into the late 20s. So the ladies arm of the Pullman car workers made their main job fundraising and distribution of education and materials and whatnot, you know, going and talking to people and educating them. Um, maids were often fired for any kind of union activism at the time. No surprise. One of those women, Frances Albiner, Albiner, formed the Pullman Maids Association in 1920. Now back to the population of Crescent City. So again, we've got these six that are standing, big powerhouse churches, right? Of course, they're not churches. But a further illustration of how they can't possibly be churches is this, a list of population statistics. In 1890, census lists the population of Crescent City at 554, 1900, 352. So that was after the blight, right? After the freeze, they lost over 200 residents. Picking back up in 1910, 677, 1920, 838, so it was growing. 1930, 955, still growing. 1940, 1,124, still growing nicely. 1950, 1,629, and I only went as far as 1960, 16, uh, 1,629, and I only went as far as 1960 because um, the church attributed to uh, Ellie Mae McDonald, the First true bride in Mount Zion Church was supposed to have been built by her in 1960. And as of the census in Wikipedia in 2020, there were 1,725 people. So this was not a really big community. And yet there were at least six big churches in a very small area. So you do with that information what you will. I think that proves that they weren't built as churches. The artist Winslow Homer loved to winter in Crescent City and fish. It is after all the vast capital of the world. Now, if we go back to pre-founding days in 1876, a British gentleman by the name of Charles Griffin arrived and purchased acreage on what is now known as Crescent Lake, but what was then known as Dunn's Lake. Now, there's also a Dunn's Creek, the big bridge that you go over to come from um, the east side of things to the west side of things. That body of water is Dunn's Lake, and there is uh, Duns Creek, excuse me, that's Duns Creek. And there is a state park back there as well, uh, Duns Creek State Park. So when Mr. Griffin came in 1876, that body of water that we call Crescent Lake was referred to as Duns Lake. It was apparently his wife, Jenny, who thought it looked like a crescent shape. And so it became known as Crescent Lake and it was on their property. So I guess they felt like they got to name it. Um, she's also the one that is supposed to have been responsible for the name of Lake Stella because she thought it looked like a star. So Mr. Griffin uh, had whatever one had to have back then to be a real estate developer. I don't know what those credentials entailed. But um, that's what he started doing is he started developing the city and advertising to sell portions off. He set up one 
acre city block plots and five acre grove plots. Then he founded the Crescent City Real Estate Association. <laughs> Travelers coming then to Crescent City would have come by a steamship along the St. John's River, up Dunn's Creek into what is now Crescent Lake and arriving somewhere there from the waterfront, I suspect on that Main Street area where all of those lovely arched red brick and um, columned um, Tartarian buildings still stand, which uh, probably were hotels. So that is what I have for you on all of this stuff. There's really very little about Pomona Park Cemetery that I could find. Very, very little um, other than the land originally, as I recall, was uh, developed by Braddock. Not Braddock, Broward, Mr. Broward, who went on to become our governor at one point back in those important days of development and also is the namesake for Broward County, Florida, the unequivocally most corrupt <laughs> county in the state. But let me take this off of slideshow and let's just go through here. I said all I want to say. Let me just run through here real quick and see if there's anything I want to mention particularly. So this is Eden Cemetery, which is back in Crescent City in town. You can tell it's somewhat cared for. See some nice old stones. That was just, isn't that just brilliant? I mean, Look at this. And it was all the way around. It was carved all the way around like that. Just beautiful. That's the winner for me of the day. That's the Tafophiliac winner, 1806. Some very beautiful pieces. Very, very beautiful. I love this to see. Can you see the guy's plan? A trumpet or a trombone. Come back. See, so uh, this was planted at this person's head, right? as is traditional. Again, that shrub was planted at their head. This is a beautiful thing, but this makes me sad because this might have been someone's tree. Isn't that beautiful? And again, that's their shrub. Look at that, oh my gosh. And that's all that's left of those three. They're completely submerged from flooding. And they just have those, uh, fortunately, they have those placards. That very well could have been that person's tree. So I love this when, when people bring different things. They've got a candle, they've got the little wind spinny thing. And uh, so that's the shrub for this family. And then the bench, I love, I love the benches. So again, <coughs> when people bring in the little uh, fencing to demarcate that space. And again, this is something else that I love. They put those solar lights there and 
all the little personal things, little statue and flowers. Again, the bench. I love the bench. So you can sit there and spend time with your loved one. Isn't that beautiful? Look at that. Look at that. I was saying yesterday, um, so people of African and Caribbean descent and uh, people of Latin and Hispanic descent, I just got to say, you people know how to take care of your ancestors. That's what I keep seeing time and time again. You people got it going on. Look at this. Holy cow. This is magnificent. Look at this. Living plants. Oh, my goodness. I love it. That's the winner. That and the uh, tree, the carved tree were the winners. Let's see, I love all this stuff. Benches. That's the beautiful stuff here. Isn't that lovely? Again, see, got it going on. Mr. Avia. Look at this. Holy cow. So beautiful. See, like these, 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 these spirits are alive. They, these spirits are alive in their family's lives. They're not gone. They're alive. Look at that. Isn't that brilliant? That inlay? just brilliant this was so sad so this was a young man that passed away uh, and he would believe that that's probably his child but uh 1996 to 2021 yeah he just passed away and he was not very old Very nice. That's beautiful. See, these people, they're, they're alive in their family's lives. Just, they're alive. They're alive. Look at all that. So nice. And this, he had a bottle of Remy. <laughs> so cool. This is as small as it looks. Yeah, this was a this was a small child. Oh, that one. Um, the woman was with her dog. That woman was not very old. Small child. Beautiful. I like to hunt. Couldn't even see, you can't even see the grave. It's just covered with all this magnificence and a really nice uh, angel statue there. 1916. See, that's his tree. That's probably his bush. I don't know whose tree that is. Again, see, I love the planting of, of trees and shrubs and things on the resting place. Beautiful, right? Look at that. They're alive. These people are alive. They're alive. Look at this. And again, this is in a neighborhood. I mean, it's surrounded by houses. It's just in a quiet neighborhood. Now, this was really sad. This is on the side one of the sides and it's all small children very small graves and children i'm saddened by how many children there were and uh in this collection here which goes out of the frame there was a child as well see these are all children all see all the flowers back here these are all children And this one, this is all that's left of um, 
there's no stone left or anything, just this. I, I don't, I think that tree is a little too old to have been planted when that person passed. So maybe they picked that spot because it was by the tree. And that was their palmetto that they planted there, just like that alignment there. Face that person between the trees. Look at that beautiful, we've got an azalea. I'm not sure what that is, but so that family is still living. World War One. Isn't that lovely? What a lovely place to rest. Look at that, oh my gosh. That huge asparagus plant, and um, I can't remember what you call that. Those little flowers. 1904. That's his plant. That's her plant. And the pelissiers. Spanish-American War. Got a baby there. This was all planted for these people. <laughs> and this was uh, out, outside of the main plotting. Um, on the other side of the driveway. You know how the driveway goes in and it's like a circular driveway and you can drive all the way around the cemetery. So on the other side of the circular driveway was this one stone. And there were more back here too, um, but it doesn't appear to be technically on the property. So I'm not sure what that meant. And you, as you can see, you couldn't read what it said. So um, that was Eden Cemetery. Now we're going to Lake Como Pomona Park Cemetery, which technically is in the city of Pomona Park which, um, as I said before, this region, um, it's just outside of Crescent City. So if you're on 207 headed in that direction, I guess it would be northeast of Crescent City. Um, this area, not this cemetery, but this area supposedly was founded by uh, Broward and uh, some of the Broward family uh, apparently still own property in this area. But look at this, um, I, you know, it's completely open and before opening any grave site, contact the supervisor. Are you kidding me? I know uh, that this cemetery has also had people doing um, paranormal work. You know, they take all the equipment at night and, you know, they get plasma readings and all that stuff. I know that's been done here. So uh, this cemetery is uh, not well cared for at all. And uh, rather sad. See, it's, you know, they mow the lawn, that's about it. And it's, it's just at the end of this dirt road and it's hot and there's a retention pond on the other side here. So it floods here uh, when the water's high. Not very well cared for. And sandy, very sandy. So it was it was very, very, very hot to walk around here. One more two. See, I love this how people uh, build like walled enclosures around their families, whether it's with stone like this or even with the uh, fencing from um, Home Depot. So we've got World War One over here. And his wife. Uh, that's a pump house in there. And that's their shrub. But again, you've got the, the family enclosure. Now, if you were to go over that road and go a little farther, there's a big retention pond. See, it's, it's neglected, but it's lovely. 
Got another walled enclosure there for the family. World War II here. Vietnam. US Army with a bench, another lovely bench and a shrub behind them. I just love this one. This is not the first time that I saw this either. Um, they, uh, they built the enclosure and filled it with shells. I can't remember what cemetery I saw, one of the ones in Crescent City where they covered it with shells. Just absolutely love that. Now that makes me think that this person was of African or um, Caribbean heritage because I've learned that shells on uh, a marking, um, that's the tradition in both of those regions. You know, I couldn't read it in person and I thought that filter would help me read it, but I still can't read it. But um, it's very, it's very dry and sandy there. It's near the back by the retention pond. And I just, I love all these enclosures. Makes it all the more hallowed. World War II, Korea. World War II. See the shells. So we probably have uh, someone from the Caribbean or of African origins. Beautiful family enclosure there. Lots of flowers. So we've got this individual here, and then we've got uh, this World War II veteran here. Same name. Look at that nice big one. Family enclosure, World War II. Nice under the tree. Got one here. It doesn't have any kind of stone left. And then you've got one back here. And then there's one over here. It's the same one. World War II, I see lots of military. Once again, World War I. Thank you, Sar, for your service. World War II. Beautiful. Let's see, when was that? 1979. So no, I don't think they planted that tree. Well, I guess they could have. Oh, were they? 1894, yeah, they could have planted that tree. Yeah, they could have planted that tree. They definitely planted that shrub, that palmetto. So we've got these people and then we've got a military person here in the family. Just love these beautiful old stones with all this nice work. 1919. So we have some military people there. World War II, World War II, same family. Uh, World War II. So it's been covered up uh, from the flooding of the um, retention pond. So can you read this? This is very sad. Killed December 14th, 1933 in a school bus train wreck. How heartbreaking is that? That's when they were all born. I just stopped dead when I read that. Just heartbreaking. 1884 passage. Beautiful cemetery, just really suffering neglect, unfortunately. 
military, military, look at that, memories. Abercrombie, 1890, 1884, isn't that nice? I guess they have a bench as a headstone um, instead of a regular stone. Thought that was kind of nice. Got a mason there. See, beautiful cemetery. Got an enclosure here. It was beautiful at the time. Look at all that beautiful work, 1880. And we've got a baby there. Military, but I can't read it. Another baby. So sad when I see the babies. Military, but I can't read it. Military, but I can't read it. Someone will know what that means. I don't know what it means. <sighs> what this stuff means. I don't know what that means. I'm sure someone knows, all military. Well, that's their palm that they planted for the Spencer family. Again, military, but I don't know what it means. World War II, World War I. Military, World War II, World War II. It's a woman. A woman Marine, look at that in World War II. That's a child. Beautiful. Un unle illegible. That's like the very back of the cemetery, right up against the retention pond. It was all sand back there, World War I. Thank you, Mr. Smith. World War II and his wife. And isn't this a beautiful, beautiful family enclosure? Look at this, oh my gosh, gorgeous. And let's see, that's been buried from flooding. Yeah, if you just go right, you follow this road back and you go right through those trees and that goes back to uh, the retention pond. World War II. That's looking into that enclosure. Uh, 1889 to 1928. And then again is looking into that and see that's a, that's a fairly recent uh, placement of uh, stuff there. So that's nice to know. They still have family in the area. 1918, 1912. So this is a child. And I've seen this a couple other times where they do something different for the child. And uh, they covered it with wet cement. And then you can see it originally was covered with shells. But uh, weather and time and um, flooding has removed them. Again, I don't know, I don't know how to read what that indicates, but military, Vietnam. And sad to see that they cut down a couple trees. Could have been someone's tree. 1901. Again, in the sandy part, we've got Vietnam, maybe. And another military stone. That's one of the two entrances. You know, it's got the circular driveway. Military stone. 1904, military, World War II, 1883. Beautiful stone. I love it when uh, they include the picture like that. I have no idea what that says. I see the folded hands, but I can't read any of that. Let's see if we can read it. 
July 30th, age 30 years. Well, that's a shame. I could only see that with the filter. I couldn't read it when I was standing in front of it. That one's completely deteriorated. That's their tree. And that's another child. Lovely little pot there. And that's standing outside the gate looking in. I think that is probably the last photo. Yes, and again, thank you for lunch, Kelly. No, that star fort is not here. I, I think that one is either in Ukraine or in Portugal. I can't remember which, but yes, Kelly took me out to lunch today. Very grateful. So, um, so thank you for hanging out with me as uh, I uh, recorded my visit to Crescent City. Once again, you've learned ridiculous uh, ephemera about places you probably didn't care about and still might not. But um, yeah, I mean, takeaway is this small community that during its colonial heyday didn't even have uh, 800 people in it needed um, six churches. Huh, I don't know, with all that water, we know there was a lot of ether to collect. So anyway, thank you. I'm going to start working on the next video, which will be a, a derivation of things that I learned looking into uh, Crescent City for this video. And um, one of them actually has to do with uh, a utopian community that uh, was very unsuccessful, but attempted nonetheless out in this part of Putnam County before it was established. Uh, some of it is now the city of Crescent City. Uh, yeah, there was a... British gentleman who wanted um, all white indentured servants to come and cultivate this land and turn it basically into a co-op. <laughs> Back in the 1800s. But anyway, that's another story. The best part of uh, doing this stuff is you never know what you're gonna find when you go down a rabbit hole and sometimes what you learn is more interesting and inspiring than what you went looking for in the first place. So anyway, thank you for hanging out with me. Thank you for lunch, Kelly. Thank you to all my subscribers. Thank you for you wonderful folks who are buying me coffee and making suggestions for things to study and just uh, being supportive and making great comments. I appreciate them all. I appreciate them all. I'm going to cut out now because you've been here long enough. This is Joyce at Medusa Was Framed saying thank you so much and see you in a couple days. <laughs>